I just want to make a quick video about uh, one of my favorite, well not my favorite books, but one of the books that's been most influential in my life. Uh, I think I'll probably be ending this video talking a little bit about God, or at least referring to God. So if you're um, theophobic, you might want to duck out about two-thirds of the way through. But this book is, uh, it's a book called The Laws of Form, uh, and I read it about 30 years ago, something like that, maybe 35 years ago. Uh, and it's written by a British mathematician called George Spencer Brown. Uh, and it was written in 1969. And it's a, it's, a, it's a mathematics book. It's a pretty unusual mathematics book for a number of reasons. But, um, and I was introduced to it because I used to read a lot of Robert Anton Wilson's science fiction. And in one of his stories, it's referred to. And I just thought it was interesting, so I bought it. Um, so it's a, it's, a book of, it's a book of maths. And it starts from first principles and leads you through uh, to develop a... Uh, a, a, new, uh, a notation system and a system of operations that you can perform on these particular uh, symbols, characters. Uh, and if you follow this math through, it allows you to solve certain problems. So the uh, the Riemann hypothesis, for example, has been proved using this, uh, what he referred to as primary algebra. Uh, the three-colour map problem, I think, was worked on or possibly solved using that particular mathematics. As I say, he calls it primary algebra. Uh, and it's, it's related to a bunch of math different mathematics, sometimes referred to as boundary math, and has relationships to things like Boolean logic and cybernetics. But it's, it's, a, it's a completely um, valid mathematical system. Uh, and there's some interesting things about it. And as I said, it has practical application. But it does start from first principles. And when I say first principles, I don't mean the first principles that you get when you're at primary school. First principles at primary school are basically identifying objects in the world and counting them. You know, there's one apple, there's two oranges, there's three alligators, there's four clothes pegs, whatever it may be. That, that's kind of how you start. And then, then you learn the operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and the various permutations of those. That's how, that's how you start when you're at primary school. But that's not first principles. First, first principles in all mathematics and um, primary algebra, laws of form is no, no exception, starts way before number. Um, uh, and, and, and these uh, operations, you know, things like saying something equals something, it's intuitively obvious now because we did it so many times when we were at primary school, we can't believe that it could be anything other way. But even those things like equals and plus and minus and all those kind of things require huge amounts of backstory to get to those points. Uh, they, as I say, they're completely intuitive because we repeated them endlessly when we were four. But, um, but in this book, Laws of Form, George Spencer Brown starts from way back before number, then takes you through something like number and category, as a, and as I say, on to what you might do with those numbers and categories to solve particular mathematical problems. Um, but it's written in this really interesting way, um, and it has some uh, relationships, as I'll try and draw out later on, with other bits of writing. Uh, so it, the writing style is unusual, it's very aphoristic, it's lots of very short sentences and little symbols. Um, and uh, and the very first thing he tries to establish is the main concept, which is this idea of distinction. That's the key thread that runs through it, this idea of distinction. If there's one concept, that's the one in primary algebra, distinction, uh, which he phrases as the making of a mark. So you, you have to kind of imagine this, um, this kind of primordial um, surface, which, you know, it's, it's literally instantiated in a piece of paper that you have in front of you. And then you make a mark on that primordial surface. So you literally make a mark on a piece of paper. And in Spencer Brown, he just draws a circle. So there's a circle in this piece of paper. And once you've done that, then you've divided this, um, this primordial void, and I think he uses the word void elsewhere, this void you divided it into a marked state and an unmarked state. So the area inside the circle that you've drawn is the marked state, and the area outside of the circle is the unmarked state. Uh, and, and, and the value of the area inside that is the value of crossing from the outside to the inside. And there's a whole series of, as I say, mathematical operations which follow from that completely logically and completely intuitively once you read it, which lead on to maths. Uh, but the point about this marked and unmarked state is they don't exist until you make the mark. You make the mark on the paper, or you imagine a mark appearing in this primordial void, and once the mark is made, 
then the, uh, the demarcated area and the undemarcated area, the marked and unmarked states, become uh, mutually arise, you might say. Um, and the, the way he phrases it, and I can't remember the exact words, I haven't looked at it, I lost, I lost this book ages ago, and I tried to get another copy, but there are about 60 quid a copy now, these books. Uh, I can't remember the exact way he phrases it, but it's, it, he phrases it in this beautiful aphoristic style. So it's something like, um, let there be a form distinct from the form, and let the value of this the distinction be the value of the mark, and the value of and the, the uh, let the value of the crossing be the value of the mark. So it's all this kind of language, which is, which is mass, because it leads to mass. But on its own, it doesn't sound like mass. It sounds like something else. It sounds like theology. Or, or spirituality or weird philosophy, platonic philosophy. So it has this weird kind of quality to it. Um, but the reason why I'm saying this is because, well, actually, one, I, I, I love it so much. I think it's fantastic. And I love it not just because it sounds beautiful, because it does when you read it, it sounds fantastic, but because, uh, because it, it does something. It has application. It turns into mass. So reading these first few passages, and I wish I had them in front of me, I don't, about let the, mark, let the making of the mark be the first distinction and the value of the mark, all that kind of stuff. It has this really beautiful, resonant, poetic sound to it. It sounds like Rumi, or it sounds like something like that. Um, it sounds like the Tao Te Ching, which I'll refer to in a minute. Uh, it has that kind of poetic effect, so you get this weird um, uh, kind of theological, spiritual glow about you, that kind of, that kind of poetry produces. And then you carry on reading, and that poetry just kind of crystallises into the poetry of reality, as Dawkins calls it, the poetry of mathematics and the poetry of science. It's, it's just a, a beautiful transformation, which I just adore. Um, but I wouldn't like it as much if it was just that first bit. I mean, I like it, but I like the fact it turns into the reality. But that first bit, and I'll just see if I can add on this bit about the Tao Te Ching. The, that first bit is very similar to the first few lines of the Tao Te Ching, which I don't know off by heart, but it's something like um, uh, the nameless is the beginning of heaven and earth and the named is the mother of the 10,000 things. It says something like that. So you have this idea that something that pre-exists the naming, this kind of primordial void, uh, is, is kind of pregnant with the promise of heaven and earth or something. There's something weird going on there. And then uh, the named is the mother of the 10,000 things, which in Chinese means everything. The 10,000 things signifies everything. So that the naming uh, produces stuff. And, it, and this naming, I think, is, is a correlate for the making of the mark. So the naming makes, produces, by distinguishing the named from the unnamed, um, produces the possibility of naming and produces all the entities and the things around us. It has that kind of a logic to it. And it's very similar, of course, to the biblical thing. And I say this is, the, this is kind of where God creeps in. Um, where if you combine that first bit of the Gospel according to John, I think it is, in, um, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was with God. I mean, for me, that has that quality of the nameless at the beginning or of the, uh, or the kind of primordial void Pre, prior to the making of the mark in primary maths. And then if you plug that back into gen, the beginning of Genesis, then you have you know, the production of the 10,000 things through this concatenation of distinctions, the distinction between heaven and earth and the light and the darkness and, and all the rest of the stuff that happens in the seven days of biblical creation. It has that kind of, um, it has a kind of resonances to those kind of processes, I think. I think that's pretty much all I can say on that, really. I mean, I was going to talk about how that's a continuing process, but I'll make another video about that. I love that book. George Spencer Brown, Laws of Form.